And I just want to thank you all so very much for opening your heart and your church to us and allowing us to do this here tonight. It means a lot to me, and I pray before we're done, it'll mean a, a whole lot to you. Now, I want to explain just a little bit what we're going to do over the next few days so you kind of get some direction of where we're going. Tonight, we're going to take it easy a little bit, and then tomorrow, we're going to get into a, a, a softer, a little bit deeper topic, but not too much. But by the time we get Sunday, we're going to start venturing out to sea, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we're just going to get deeper and deeper and deeper. And the intention is to really take a, a firm grasp and understanding of the gospel. Now, I take it easy in the beginning because I've learned something. I've done this lecture now 30 times, and I've watched what happens in people's lives. It's not just a bunch of knowledge and wisdom and understanding, and we can pass the test at the end of the day. But what starts to happen is something inside the heart, a, a transformation, a change begins to take place. At first, it's imperceptible. It kind of creeps up on you. You don't really know what's going on until it starts to really happen in your life. And so every lecture builds upon that. Every lecture is going to take you into a little bit deeper relationship with God until we get to the fullness of the gospel. Now, you might be wondering about the set. It has a very old feel to it, doesn't it? It's my kind of feel. It's got a Texas feel to it, but it's really not a Texas feel. It's an old feel. It comes from the mid-1800s. And we're doing this in commemoration of a group of people that were going along in their Christian experience, and all of a sudden they were enlightened with the truth. And that truth that they learned inspired them, and they stayed up all night long in barns because their houses were too small to, to carry all the people. And they were hanging out on wagon wheels, I'm sure, preaching from barrels, on hay bales, whatever it took, and they were enthralled with the new things that they were learning. And that message that this group of people in the mid-1840s were just so inspired by was called the three angels message and that message inspired them because for centuries the prophecies had been obscured in darkness some of the great minds of old tried to crack them and here all of a sudden out of nowhere a group of people had been enlightened to understand it and they couldn't get enough of the prophecies of the great judgment of, of who babylon was or what was the mark or what was the beast or the seal of god or the remnant church and all this was coming to their understanding, and they were so fired up about it. But there was something much greater than the prophecies that they learned that excited them even more than that, and it was the gospel. It was the gospel that was illuminated by the prophecies. They saw the importance of understanding the teachings of Christ as we were entering into that final phase of earth's history. And as they combined the gospel together with the prophecies, these people had something else happen to them. And that was an experience. For the first time in their Christian lives, as they brought these two great things together, prophecy and the gospel their lives were illuminated. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they went out and you couldn't keep them quiet. And it's that experience that we want to recapture. We want to get back into that understanding of the gospel that once moved our forefathers to staying up all night long. Nothing else mattered but that gospel understanding and how it related to the, to the prophecies and the signs of the times. So I want to start off with a little bit of my story and share with you some of the things that happened in my earlier life so that you'll understand why I'm going to say the things that I'm going to say and what burns in my heart, you'll get it. Because I lived a life where I understood prophecy, but I didn't have the gospel. And I want to tell you what happened to me because of that. And what happened to me when I brought the gospel together with the prophecies, I had the experience of our forefathers and I myself have not been able to shut up ever since. So I want to tell you a little bit where I started off. My religious experience in life didn't happen until I was about nine or ten years old. It was in the late 70s uh, that my grandfather and his mother actually became Seventh-day Adventist. Ron Halverson was one of the ones that kind of came through with my parents, but before him was the Turners and uh, the Barron brothers came through. They put up those big tents down there in Houston, Texas. And that's how my grandfather and his mother and eventually my uncles and my aunts and my parents, they came into the church under that. So I was about nine or 10 years old. And all I remember was one Saturday morning, there was no cartoons on and there was a suit on the couch. 
And that's what I had to, to put on and go to this strange place. And that's where my religious experience began. And from the beginning, I remember hearing about Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. I cut my teeth on those ideas and things. I, I remember listening to evangelists. I remember listening to Halverson. I was old enough to remember him talking about a lion and a bear. And I remember uh, putting my head over the pew waiting to see the lion and the bear. I thought at any moment it was going to come down the aisle. And of course, later in life, I realized he was given a Daniel Revelation seminar. And so despite my, my early upbringing in church, as I'm going into my teenage years, my life is filled full of drama. I'd been in the church about five years, listened to all the great Adventist topics and ideas. But my life as a teenager was filled full of girl drama, filled full of troubles. I was kicked out of a junior high in the seventh grade for throwing a desk at my teacher. I had a terrible temper as a kid. And I had all kinds of issues going on, but yet I was still in church. I was going with every Sabbath faithfully to church like a lot of our young kids do. And then I rolled on into my high school years, still going to church, but my life was getting more and more filled with more and more drama. I had girl trouble like you wouldn't believe, constantly in trouble with some kid or fighting or arguing with parents. I mean, it was just, it was a rough life. And there was one area of my life that I did really well in. And that area of my life was sports. I excelled in sports. I had a scholarship to Southwest Baptist, Baptist University and to Kansas State for football and for track at Lamar and many places. So I did really well. And despite all of that, I, I thought I was going to go on and play professional sports one day. But my dysfunctions, my distortions and my sin caught up with me still in church at this time. But I decided that I was going to go grab my girlfriend, take my new truck that my dad bought me to go to school in and run off to Mississippi and get married. So off to Mississippi, we was married down there in Biloxi and we came back to back home to Texas. And I remember going back to the little church and I told the pastor, I want to I want to be a church member. I want to be baptized. And he said, oh, here, take these these 14 Amazing Facts Bible studies. And I began to look at him and go, oh, I got this made, man. I, I've been doing this stuff since I was a kid. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. I got this down. I got prophecy. Oh, I know what happens when you die. I understand the 20, 30 years. I, I took the test. I checked all the list off. Uh, do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I believe in Jesus. They baptized me and I came up and the next 15 years of life proved 10,000 times harder than those Bible studies ever did. Within those 15 years, I tore my life yet I'm still going to church every week. I'm not eating pork. I'm keeping the Sabbath. I, I know what's going on over in the Vatican. I know Babylon, Amida, Persia, Greece, and Rome. But my life was spinning out of control with my family. Those 15 years were filled with infidelity, temper blow-ups, anger, depression, anxiety, misery, all kinds of troubles that you could imagine but I'm still in church. I still know what's going on in Rome. I still know the right day to worship on. But then life fell to pieces. 15 years of living that way with someone else that was about as dysfunctional as I was, it ended as you can imagine it would end. The unthinkable happened. She fell in love with someone else. She went off to another part of the world with this person. And I had the two old eldest children, my youngest child. She left with her. She raised her. And I lost her. I mean, that was she was about seven or eight years old. I didn't hardly see her ever again, but once a year. And when you lose something that that was holding you somewhat together, what I hadn't done in life at that time, I started to do. I just come unglued. I had nothing holding me together. I got into worse trouble, more problems in and out of relationships, fired from one job to the next, couldn't keep my head up, depressed, anxiety. They had me on this pill and that medicine, trying to figure it out, but there was really one problem wrong with me. And it wasn't because I was depressed. It's because I didn't know the gospel. And just when you would think that things got worse, when you think that they couldn't get worse, they got worse. I met a woman, another woman. Everyone warned me, don't get involved with another person this close after marriage. And so I decided that I was going to move in with this person. 
and I was going to start all over again. And whether I had God in my life, I don't know. I was just going to take care of what I needed. I needed to get whole. I needed to get healed. Well, I moved my family in with her family, and it lasted about long enough for it to end. About three months of that, and I was out of there. I called my little brother, come home and get me, man. Pick me and my children up. He came with a bunch of buddies. He moved me. I was back home at mother, 30 years old, without a job, living with my mom, with my two kids. And then I get a phone call. And that's how my baby girl came into this world. And now my misery and humiliation was complete. I was actually a first-year ministry student at this time. Decided I wanted to be a pastor amongst all this mess. The Texas conference came down and put me on censorship. Pulled me out of the pulpit and said, young man, you need to sit down for a while. Your life is a wreck. No, they didn't. They said, hey, you just hang in there and we'll see what happens in your life. But for now, you need to chill out. So you can imagine the embarrassment and the shame. And I was a wreck. My health was a wreck. My life was a wreck. But yet I knew Babylon and Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. I knew what was going on over there in Rome. I knew what the mark was. I, I knew what the seal was. I knew who the beast was. And then one night, one night it happened. I had had enough of life and people, and things, and thoughts. And you know how it is when you have one of those things that happen to you? It's just the straw that breaks the camel's back. You can't take no more. I had one of those nights where I'd had enough. I pulled my truck over. I got out of the truck and went across the road into this pasture, and I started letting God have it. I started letting him know how I feel. I had been looking at an annual that night before, and there I was on the front cover, you know, in my football uniform, ready, ready for greatness. I had some little caption on there about me. And then I was looking at that and looking at my life at 32 years old, under censorship by my church, divorced, living with my mother, a life, a wreck. And I was asking God, how could this happen? I mean, I've been in church my whole life. I've served you. I've kept the Sabbath. I've paid my tithe. I don't eat the right, the right or wrong things. What has happened to my life? And I began to just erupt in anger with God. But that's when it happened. That is when the most glorious thing ever happened to me. It wasn't no epiphany. I didn't see God. I didn't hear his voice. I didn't feel no angel wing go by my body. But I had this feeling, this feeling that he had heard me. And it was hope. Hope sprang up in my heart because I know that he heard me. I may have said too much. But I felt that God was listening to me, that God was finally taking me into his life and that there was some hope that something could happen. Now, hope always leads us to a certain place. And that's what first Col that Colossians chapter one, verse 23 says. Colossians chapter one, verse 23 If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. You see, hope always points me to the gospel. God was telling me, yeah, boy, you got Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome down. You got prophecies down. Now you need the gospel. Now you need to figure out what's going on in your life. And the gospel was going to be that remedy for me. And it would be a process of me learning and coming to understand what it was that I was truly missing in my life. It was a haunting question that I finally stopped and asked myself, how could I be in church all these years and not know the gospel? Not get its pillar points, not be changed or transformed with it. I had some kind of blindness over me because I understood what was going to happen at the end of time. I felt comfortable in my life. I felt like I was okay because I understood that I could choose the right day and I'd be okay. But I had no understanding of the right way of the day. And it was the way that I needed more than anything else. Is it possible that I was blinded because I understood doctrinal truths? Because I know what happens when you die or if hell's eternal or the millennium or 
or the state of the dead? Is it possible that my doctrinal understanding and my great prophetic understanding, my ability to explain all that, somehow blinded me to the fact that I didn't know the gospel? That it's true. Because I pounded my kids over and over with doctrines and understandings. Do you know what day you're supposed to worship? Or do you understand what this means? Do you know who the beast is? Do you understand what the seal is? They had to understand the truths to be saved, so I thought. And today, my kids will tell you that they don't know the gospel. They don't understand its rudiments, but they'll tell you Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. They got that. And you could ask my family, who are all at one time, all in the church. And to this very day, you can talk to them, and they still understand the statue, and they still understand the four beasts, and they still understand the 2,300 years, but they do not know the gospel. That's why they left the church. Is it a fair evaluation? Well, I've been at New Start for two and a half years, and I've seen about 700 people come through the program. And of those 700 people, 70% are Seventh-day Adventists. And of those 70% that are Seventh-day Adventists, I have talked to scores and scores and dozens of dozens of ex-Seventh-day Adventists. And I always ask them, why did you leave? And I always get similar replies. It's not the doctrines. It's not the prophecies. They didn't know the gospel. They didn't understand the gospel. Or they heard the gospel somewhere else outside of the church and they was just moved by it and touched by it. And so they left the church because they found Jesus over here. But they still understand Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now, I don't mean that we don't hear about Jesus. I didn't mean that I've never heard about the cross or salvation or him dying for me. But what I mean is, So many of us have never had the experience of the gospel. We got the understanding, we got the knowledge, but we've never had the experience. And we've never heard it in a systematic, consistent way that will allow the experience to take place. Sometimes we're we're such in a hurry and such in a rush and we're hearing such a hodgepodge of ideas and messages that the gospel never has time to take root and sink down into the bones to do something. And it is that gospel that we desperately need. It is that gospel that our forefathers clung to and loved in light of prophecy, not without it. Now, here's the scary part. Here's the scary part. God did put my life back together. He did restore me. He gave me a beautiful new wife. He repaired my relationship with my kids. I did go on and went to to Southwestern and got my degree in theology. I did go on and get my master's from Andrews. I did go on and become a pastor. Twelve years into my ministry, one terrible board meeting takes place. I'm at a church and everything is spiraling out of control. The secretary gives uh, her, her report. She says, tithe is down. Membership is down. People are leaving and going to other churches. Something's got to be done. And then she looked at me. I had given this ministry my heart for 12 years. I preached Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. I preached Daniel. I preached Revelation. I lifted up the judgment. I gave it all that I could give. And after 12 years, my ministry was tanking. And I had enough. I was burnt out on all of this. I remember laying on the, on the pulpit that night. And I just told God, look, I want to go back home to Texas and be an electrician again. Just be a good churchman, support some pastor somewhere. I'm done with all this. I'm tired of it all. I don't need this no more. I've given you my best. And then the next day, I get a phone call from my brother. He says, man, you got to read this book. I found this book. You got to read this book. So I drive all the way to Gentry, Arkansas, from where I was, a couple hours. And I get this book. And it was a book called, Why Didn't They Tell Me? by Morris Finley. And as I read those pages, my mouth just dropped open. And I began to weep. As I read chapter after chapter, I kept saying, my God, I didn't know the gospel. I'm a pastor. I've done evangelism. I've been a Bible worker. I I didn't know the gospel. Next chapter, I'm going my marriage. Uh, The things that I did, I didn't know the gospel. The way I treated my kids, I didn't know the gospel. I've been in church since I was 18. I've cut my teeth on on Halverson and some of the greatest evangelists since I was a kid and I didn't know the gospel. How is that?
So people ask me, what is the wheel of faith? The will of faith, it's the remedy for broken marriages and broken homes. The will of faith is the remedy for the dead and lifeless Seventh-day Adventist churches, the ones that are. It is the remedy for the unconverted. It is the message of the true and faithful witness to the Laodiceans. It is the message of the 144,000. It's the third angel's message. It's the seal of the living God. It's what causes the great Advent shaking. It's what brings about the time of trouble. It is the seal of God. It is the 1888 message. It is the message that goes into the world like fire in the stubble. It is this message. The end is near. We have not a moment to lose. Light is to shine forth from God's people in clear, distinct rays, bringing Jesus before the churches and before the world. And every ray of light received is to be communicated to others. One interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up all others. Christ, our righteousness. That is the message that the world is dying to hear. That is the message this 18-year-old boy needed to hear. And it is the message I am telling you, you need to hear, your children need to hear, our church needs to hear, our conference, our division, and the world needs to hear. And when they hear it, combined with Babylon, Medo, Persia, and Greece, and Rome, they will see that the gospel is illuminated through prophecy. Prophecy is meaningless without the gospel. And so tonight I want to start where the gospel always begins. It starts in a particular place. If you're in Steps to Christ, chapter 1, you'll know it. If you're in the book of Acts, you'll know it. If you're in Romans chapter 1, you'll know it. The gospel always begins in this place. There was a people of God at the time of Ezekiel who were not too much unlike us. They had prophecies. They had health laws. They had the right day of worship. They paid tithes and offerings, but they did not know the gospel. And Paul says of his people that the gospel was preached to them in Hebrews 4, as well as it's preached to us just in a different way. And the reason why they failed at being the people of God is because they had the prophecies. They had Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome in a different way. They had diet, they had health, they had it all, but they didn't have the gospel and they failed at being God's people. And I'm telling you, we we're going to make the same mistake today. If we have prophecy and not the gospel, and I'm not talking about just Jesus saves and he died on the cross. I am talking about the depth and the understanding that the gospel is going to take us. That's why I'm begging you to hang out with me in the kiddie pool for a little while because this thing gets deep. As a result of them not knowing the gospel, God has to strip them of everything. In the book of Ezekiel, this is the time where they're being carted off into captivity. Jeremiah warned them, you better turn back to the living God, and they wouldn't. And all of those curses in Deuteronomy were now being heaped upon their head, and God is allowing it because he's got to get them back to the gospel. He's got to get them back to this first understanding in the book of Ezekiel. Step number one is right where God's taken them. And so as Ezekiel is being raised up, he says, go tell my people a parable as they're being carted off into captivity, as their beautiful temple is burned and all their writings are burned and their houses are burned and their temples gone and their walls are broke down and the gates are burned and the people are being carted off. Their princes are eunuchs in a foreign man's court. He says, go tell my people this prophecy, Ezekiel chapter 16. Man, this is the gospel, by the way. Ezekiel 16 is an Old Testament gospel. Ezekiel 16, verse 1 through 5, he says, Ezekiel, go tell my people this. I'm going to bring them back to this truth. Step number one. Oh, again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations and say, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, Your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. No eye pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you, but you were thrown out into the open field when you yourself were loathed on the day that you were born. I mean, that is a powerful word, loathed. Not hate, not dislike, but loathed. I mean, the picture is clear, right? This doesn't sound like good news. It doesn't sound like the gospel, or is it? The day that you were born, your mother took one look at you, right? The only, only group of people that the Amorites and Hittites hated worse than each other were Jews. This child is born from some kind of weird three-way conglomeration, and the mother took one look at it and went, oh, my gosh, just 
threw it out into open field, and everybody walked away from it. Now, what kind of good news is that? In fact, it reminds me of a story where I'm from in Houston, Texas, one February cold afternoon. A woman going behind the, the stores with a bag and a basket, looking for things to put in her bag, and she's going through dumpster after dumpster, and there she comes across a, a Walmart bag, and it looks full, and she reaches in to grab it, and it starts to move. She opens it up, and there is a little blue baby in there, just almost dead. She gets it. She rushes it down to Bentob Hospital. They revive this child, and they nickname it Baby Chloe. She becomes the most wanted child in Houston, Texas. Everyone was wanting to adopt this child, but not this child in Ezekiel's story. Ezekiel's child, nobody wants this kid. In fact, this child is a symbol of every child and every daughter of Adam and Eve. It's a symbol of mankind, not just Ezekiel's people. But when Adam and Eve sinned, we become detestable in the universe. We joined the arch rebel. We were rebels against God. We were in treason. We, we became this child that no one wanted anything to do with that should have been thrown out into an open field. Listen to what John Wesley, the great Methodist revivalist, says about this child. Man's heart is altogether corrupt and abominable. This is the natural state of humanity. Humanity has no internal resources to offer or contribute to the work of salvation. Humanity in the natural state is without any awareness that there is God, any awareness that it stands under divine condemnation, and any awareness that it needs to be saved. Humanity is incapable of doing any good. Humanity is dead to God and dead in sin. Now, that still don't sound like good news. Isaiah, 150 years before, as he's watching his people, the ten northern tribes, are being carried off by the Assyrians, never more to come back home. Isaiah, watching that terrible train of people being carted off, he says this in deep lamentation in Ezekiel chapter 60, uh, Isaiah 64, verse 6. He says this, but we are all like an unclean thing. And all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf. And all our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Isaiah had it right. Ezekiel had it right. John Wesley had it right. And are our lives living testimonies of this? I don't know about you. I didn't ask to be born into this world. I didn't ask to be raised by less than perfect parents that allowed me to grow up in public schools and around every kind of evil and nasty and perverted influence. I didn't ask to figure it out by the time it was too late. By the time I figured out I was messed up, it was so much part of who I was that I would spend most of my life struggling just to try to figure out what is wrong with me. I'm 32 years old and trying to figure out what's wrong. I understand Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. I got it, Lord. What is wrong? What was wrong was I'm like this child cast out into the open field. I had all the right procedures and understanding and knowledge just like the Jews did, but I didn't have the gospel. And this is a major point of the parable. Why is God beating up on them? To make them feel bad? Oh, no. You see, before we can see God in his truest light, before we can see a God of love, we have to see our lives in their truest light. This is what God is trying to do. He's trying to help them understand what they are so they can finally grasp who he is. He has not left us. In fact, thank God for Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 6. Thank goodness the story doesn't end there. It probably should have. Maybe the universe would have been better off if it had. But verse 6 says, And when I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you, in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you, in your blood, live. In other words, God said, I came by the dumpster of the world. I came by the dumpster of Damon Sneed's life. I seen you struggling in your blood and I looked at you and I could have passed you by, but I didn't. I said, live, Curtis Damon Sneed. He saw me struggling in that open field that day, crying out to him, Lord, what's wrong? I'm doing everything right, right? He's like, oh no, now he's asking the right questions. Now I can tell him to live. And how does he tell me to live? What does it mean to live? This is our first breath. This is the first step to the gospel. It happens in verse 7 and 8. 
I made you thrive like a plant in the field and you grew and you matured and you become very beautiful. Your breasts were formed, your hair grew, but you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed, your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you. This is the first step to the gospel. On our wheel of faith, God's love. Simple, clean, pristine. I love you, but I know what you are. And I need you to know what you are so that you can know that I love you in spite of yourself. And when you can begin to wrestle with the fact that God of the universe loves me, it begins to do something to the mind. It begins to do something to the heart when you start wrestling with these concepts of what I am and what he is. And it's imperceptible. It's silent. You don't recognize it at first, but something is happening in the mind that will begin to open up into a deeper understanding and an experience in the gospel. And it is only after that we can grasp that God loves us that the rest of the gospel can become a reality. Because when you read verses 9 through 14, if you've got gospel ears on, these are all quotes that the New Testament are quoting from. These are all places that the Gospels are writing about. They're coming, most of them, out of the book of Ezekiel. And if you've got your Gospel ears on, your New Testament language, you will hear it as we're reading 9 through 14. Then I washed you in water. Yes, I anointed you with oil. I washed off your blood. I clothed you in embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorn you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrist and a chain on your neck. I put a jewel in your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver and your clothing was fine linen. Your fame, verse 14, went out among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through my splendor, which I have bestowed upon you. These are words and ideas that Paul would take and flesh out. When you're in the book of Psalms, Psalms is writing about the gospel all over the place. Psalms would say, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. That's where Ezekiel's getting it from. Revelation 3, verse 18, buy from me gold trod in the fire that you may be rich in white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve. The revelator is writing out of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is about the gospel. It is about how the gospel is obtained. It is about a child that had every privilege of prophecy and doctrine and everything to do that was right and wrong, but she didn't have the gospel and she became like a child thrown out into the open field, left for dead. And God came along and said, I want you to live, child. And the way that he wants us to live is to receive the gospel. And we receive the gospel. This very first step is to recognize that my God loves me. And that has a powerful impact upon the life. And because they did not understand this God loves you thing, they could not live out the gospel. It was an impossibility. If you don't know that God loves you, you're going to live something else. Rather than a life of faith, you're going to live a life of fear. Right? I mean, everything comes down to fear. In my young life, I didn't have this understanding that God loved me. So I didn't live a life of faith. I lived a life of fear. So when something bad happened to me, when someone took something from me, I reacted in fear because I didn't have it to give. I, I was trying to make it on my own. Every dollar mattered. I was stressed out and constantly aggravated because I was always worried about money. Fear, fear. I was always worried that, that she was going to run around on me. So, so I had jealousy, fear. Fear causes us to be distorted. Fear causes depression. Fear causes anxiety. Fears cause all kinds of weird ways of dealing with life. And you know what the book of Revelation says about the fearful. They cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. And at the base, the reason why fearful people are fearful is because they do not know the love of God. If you knew the love of God, you would not be living lives of fear. I wouldn't have, but I did. And the gospel wants us to understand step number one, God loves you. Quit being full of fear.
Ezekiel 16 is the John 3, 16 of the Old Testament. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's an old truth that we've heard in Sabbath school. We sing it in our hymns, and it's something we try to teach our little kids, but it's something us older kids should remember. That Jesus does love me. He loves Damon Sneed. And that means something. That's just not some empty phrase. It means something to God. It means he's willing to help me. When I finally get my mind up where it needs to be, when I finally start looking to him for answers, and the answers are in the gospel, a God of love will always answer. There's an Ezekiel's child in the 20th century. When I went back to college, one of the first assignments I had to do was write an essay on a raisin in the sun by Lorena Hansberry. And I remember writing out my points of this essay and what the story meant. And man, I get to the end of it and it is a tearjerker because it is a beautiful picture of God's love. And the story is a, a young man is wanting to get out of the ghetto. And he's always trying some scheme to get his family free and so they could have money and move out into the countryside. Well, the father ups and dies. The son's devastated. The mom's devastated. The daughter's devastated. The little boy's devastated. But to their surprise, the dad had a life insurance policy. And they had this chunk of money now that they didn't have before. And so they had all these plans. The daughter was going to go to law school. The son was going to start some kind of business. This kid now could, could go to a real school. They was going to buy him a little, a little place out in the country and get out of the ghetto finally. But the boy is rash and he's impetuous. The oldest son, he feels like he's the man of the family. So without mama knowing, he goes into the room and takes all the money. And he goes out and does some back alley liquor store deal with a friend. Invests all the family's money and he's waiting to hear from him when the new business is going to start. Well, you know what happens. It's a scam. The guy takes all the money, runs off. He can't hear from him. The phone is, is disconnected, and he's full of panic, and the story just builds and builds and builds. And finally, he comes to the family in the room, and they're all talking about what they're going to do with the money and how they're going to get out of poverty. And he just trembles, and he has to say, I lost all the money. It's all gone. And the entire family is enraged. The daughter is just screaming and yelling at him. The other son wants to kill him. Everyone is so mad. The, the in-laws can't believe it. The family can't believe it. You've destroyed your family. You're worthless. And then mama stands up. And mama stands up as she said, child, when a man has done his worst, that's when he needs loving the most. And that is the story of Ezekiel. We are children thrown out into an open field. We are loathsome. We are detestable. We have been told if we could compare ourselves to Adam and his purity, 6,000 years later, the human family would barely be recognizable. And yet, at the worst that humans have become, right here before the coming of Christ, we are the worst of the worst. You know that. They don't get no worse than what we are. Yet God loves us the most. And it's why he waited to the last final generation of mankind to give them the greatest revelation of the gospel through prophecy and the three angels' message. And he wants it to be part of your life. He wants you to move past just Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and Rome. He wants to move you into the deep currents of the gospel to see lives transformed to see you come alive, to see you excited like our, our forefathers hanging out on wagon wheels with their Bible open on bated breath, listening to every word. Or, or over here, listening to some guy from a barrel pulpit because that's all they had. He wants us to be excited about him again, about the gospel again, about how it relates to what's going on in our world today. And he'll do that if you keep coming back. If you keep coming God will do something powerful in your life. Now, I want to read and I want to conclude with this big idea. This is the big idea. We got to conclude with this. This is from chapter one of Steps to Christ, last paragraph. Such love is without a parallel. Children of the heavenly king, theme for the most profound meditation 
the matchless love of God for a world that did not love him. Here's the punchline. The thought has a subduing power upon the soul and brings the mind into captivity to the will of God. Just the love of God, not some deep teaching in Galatians, not some new prophecy of what Islam's doing, but the thought, the love of God, has the power unlike anything else to bring the mind into captivity to the will of God. So you got to let it swish around in there. Meditate on it. Think about it. Like our song, Jesus loves me. And something begins to imperceptible happen in the heart. And if you let it drag you and pull you where it wants to take you, you will never, ever be the same when we leave here next Sabbath. I can promise you that. I have seen it time and time again and in my own life. I'm no babbling fool. I have experienced it. The song, Jesus Loves Me, was a poem written to comfort a dying child. We are a dying world. Our families are dying. Our children are dying. For God in heaven, our church is dying. It is in the worst trouble she has ever been. And there has never been a time like now that we need to know the gospel. And we got to start here with the great love of God. Let us have prayer. Our Father in heaven, with all our living heart and living soul, we pray that such a simple thought would come into our mind as we receive it that God does love us and that has meaning to God and it will have meaning to us as we begin to have an experience, not just knowledge, but an experience in you that will change and transform our lives forever. Oh God, will you prepare us tonight that we could shut everything out and just focus on your love. Gather around our tables tonight and talk about just your love and let it do what it's done for generations of mankind. May you bless us, Lord, to this end we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.